So this is how AI is assisting students with a disability. Uh, so I'm going to look at um, three different types of ability that AI can assist with. So the first one is a uh, neurodiverse and um, neurodiverse students can uh, often have ideas but struggle to put them in words. So um, it can help with uh, enhancing the vocabulary. Um, paraphrasing allows students to create more concise text as uh, students can often create rambling and in some cases inc incoherent text, which loses the emphasis of their writing. Um, expand the thought process by pulling up ideas from a vast database of knowledge. Um, this allows um, other people can have the thoughts, it allows them to evolve their thought process by drawing information from other thought sources. And for the hearing impaired, um, AI generates subtitles and transcripts. Um, this provides a more inclusive learning environment for students with a hearing impairment, allows them to, into, to engage in live teams or Zoom lectures. And for the visually impaired, I think uh, the, the, the text there speaks for itself. Uh, with these in, innovations, a visually impaired student can be fully immersed in the academic environment. Slide two. So we've all heard of, and I imagine will be discussed throughout this week, apps like ChatGTP, Copilot, Grammarly, etc. So I'm going to show you four short videos of AI being used in applications uh, you might not have come across before, uh, with the possible exception of MindView. So the videos range from two to four minutes long, and all the applications you're going to see are DSA approved and CNAI is a, a free application for mobile phones. So the first one I'll show you is JAWS, um, is a software application used by the severely impaired, and this is the uh, smart AI in use in a Zoom meeting. Using picture smart AI in a Zoom meeting with JAWS. Now I wanna show you how to use picture smart AI to describe or have it describe the information that's on the screen when someone shares their screen in a Zoom meeting. So Ron Miller is here in the meeting and I have shared a PowerPoint slide here on the screen. And so we're going to use Picture Smart AI here in JAWS to have it describe this slide that I have because historically what happens is someone shares a document or a web page or a slide or PowerPoint presentation, but JAWS can't detect that information because it is viewed as an image. So we can't actually access the information that's being shared, but with Picture Smart AI, you can get a description of that picture. So now Ron is going to invoke Picture Smart AI by pressing insert space. Space. All right, he's entered the command layer and P for Picture Smart. Picture Smart. And then there are several commands he could use here, and, and we'll tell you how to learn more about Picture Smart AI here in just a few moments. But Ron is now going to press W to share the or to have the current window described. Picture Smart is in progress. All right, we're going to give it a moment here to give us a short description. The image displays a slide titled Connect With Us. It lists various social media and contact platforms along with their respective links or usernames for connecting. The platforms mentioned are X formerly Twitter, at Freedom Scientific Facebook, Freedom Scientific Incorporated Instagram, at Freedom Scientific YouTube, Freedom Scientific Training Podcast, freedomscientific.com slash training slash podcasts blog, blog freedomscientific.com email, training at vespero.com TikTok, tiktok.com slash at freedomscientificmastodon, at freedomscientific at mastodon.social. Icons representing each platform are shown next to their names. The slide is viewed in a Zoom meeting context. Link ask questions about this image. Link get more details. Link give feedback about this feature. Link give feedback about this feature. All right, so that gave us a description of the slide. It actually gave us an excellent description of the slide. So this is our connect with us slide that we use at the end of the webinars. And we we could actually read through this information one line or one word at a time. You could copy and paste it somewhere. And this is just the basic description that you get when you first invoke Picture Smart AI. There's a link to give you more details. You could also ask questions and get more information about, for example, you know, maybe one of the ways you could connect with us. You could ask it for some specific information about our uh, Facebook icon or our X icon. So that is how you can use Picture Smart AI to get information about what is being shared on the screen during a meeting. When you're finished, you can press escape. 
So you can hear straight away how, how that can you know, absolutely help someone with a visually impaired and straight away it just picks up the image and reads all that text aloud for them. So again, like to talk about making it inclusive. Um, the next one you're going to see is Otter AI. And the important thing to, to note about this application is that it incorporates into your Outlook calendar and will automatically record the meeting. So, so certain neurodiverse students will struggle with organizational skills. So they found this feature extremely useful because if they forget to go to meeting or they forget it's going to happen, this will automatically start, start and record the lecture for you. So this is Otter AI. Otter AI the essential tool for students and educators. It provides real-time captions and notes for both in-person and virtual classes. Say goodbye to manual note-taking. Connect Otter to your calendar and let it automatically join and record your Zoom, Teams, and Google Meet meetings. It captures lecture slides and adds them to your notes, so you never miss any context. Plus, real-time captions ensure accessibility. You can highlight, comment, and insert images in your notes, making studying a breeze and after the lecture, Otter automatically generates a summary. Try it now. Get the link in description and pinned comment. There you go, that was Otter AI. Just a quick mention on that one. Um, obviously, with our version of Office 365, we, we block a lot of um, add-ons, etc. But I've got um, access to Active Directory. So if a student was, was um, given it by DSA or, for example, a member of staff wants it by DSE, um, then I can add them in active directly so they can add the add-on as well to the Outlook calendar. Okay, the next one we're going to see is a it's a free phone, free phone app for the severely visually impaired or, or blind. Um, you'll have to bear with the Americanization of it. It's an American video, but this is a Seeing AI. Seeing AI is a Microsoft research project for people with visual impairments. The app narrates the world around you by turning the visual world into an audible experience. Point your phone's camera, select a channel, and hear a description. The app recognizes saved friends. Jenny near top right, three feet away. Describes the people around you, including their emotions. 28-year-old female wearing glasses looking happy. It reads text out loud as it comes into view, like on an envelope. Ken Lawrence, P.O. Box. Or a room entrance. Conference 2005. Or scan and read documents like books and letters. The app will guide you and recognize the text with its formatting. Top and left edge is not visible. Hold steady. Lease agreement. This agreement. Exit. When paying with cash, the app identifies currency bills. 20 US dollars. When looking for something in your pantry or at the store, use the barcode scanner with audio cues to help you find what you want. Campbell's tomato soup. When available, hear additional product details. Heated microwave bowl on height. And even hear descriptions of images in other apps like Twitter by importing them into Seeing AI. A close up of Bill Gates. Finally, explore our experimental features like scene descriptions to get a glimpse of the future. I think it's a young girl throwing a frisbee in the park. Experience the world around you with the Seeing AI app from Microsoft. Like I said, that's a free app. I mean, I've got it on my phone. I got shown it years ago by um, an ex-military fellow who, who'd been blinded. And um, it, it's, it's come on a lot since then. Like, But you can see how ace that is, you know what I mean? Just walking around, taking pictures of so you know where you are or like for documents scanning documents if, if you're visually impaired student you can literally take a photo and it'll read the document out so it's, it's cracking up like say it's free so you know go away download it and have a little play with it if, if, if you like it can be quite funny as well i've used it to obviously take pictures of people and you can put your own description of the person so if i've, I've never met a person before but we'll meet them again you can take a picture of the person Put your own description and of that person, but the name. So the next time you come to go, you know, you know who it is when you're speaking to them. So it's brilliant. Um, this is a mind, mind view. It's a mind mapping tool, and probably the one most people have heard of. And um, we're still running mind view version six at present on our university PCs, but um, I'm in discussion with the vendors to upgrade to version nine. So hopefully we should have this on all our um, university computers with the AI included. So this is a mind view. In this MindView video tutorial, we will explore the new AI feature in MindView. This revolutionary addition will completely transform your planning, research and writing process. Say goodbye to creative blocks with MindView's predefined prompts. 
These prompts serve as a starting point and inspiration for your mind mapping process. From business strategies to personal projects to researching and learning new concepts, the AI powered prompts will spark your imagination and guide you towards generating innovative ideas. Let's imagine that we're planning on opening a brand new coffee shop in London. Let's get started by putting that into the middle of our mind map. To help spark our imagination, we're going to use the AI to brainstorm off this topic. The AI algorithm analyzes your topic and generates a wide range of suggestions to help you expand on your ideas, discover new angles, and explore different perspectives. One of the key benefits of the AI feature is the ability to generate insightful questions. The AI algorithm analyzes the information and generates thought provoking questions to deepen your understanding and guide your research. Now, Let's move into the writing of our marketing plan for our new coffee shop. Let's focus in on marketing and promotion on the mind map. Are you tired of spending hours proofreading your content or just struggle to articulate the ideas in your mind into the written format? Well, this is where MindView's AI feature is here to help as it offers grammar checks, rephrasing suggestions, simplification options, and even content expansion on your ideas. In this example, let's focus in on creating an effective online presence, and we're going to expand on this idea using our text note editor. Here, I've written a couple of sentences, both with bad grammar and spelling mistakes. Let's see how first the grammar check is going to improve my text. First, highlight the text that you want to edit and navigate to the AI function in the text note editor ribbon toolbar. We're going to edit our text and fix the grammar. Here, the AI has not only helped our grammar, but has also helped with our spelling. Now, sometimes the text you've written just doesn't seem as clear as the idea you had in your head. Let's see how Simplify will make your text more impactful. Highlight the text again that we want to edit. And this time, when navigating to the AI, let's select Simplify. As you can see, the text has become much clearer and more concise. Maybe you're just looking to expand on your ideas. In this case, I know I need to create a social media campaign, but I don't really know how to get started with my writing. Let's highlight this text. And this time, let's expand. With the power of AI at your fingertips, you can ensure your writing is polished, error free and captivating. Let this AI feature be your personal writing assistant. With the AI feature integrated into MindView, your productivity will soar. From idea generation to content refinement, the AI algorithms provide valuable insights and suggestions, allowing you to streamline your workflow and accomplish more in less time. Get started with MindView today. Okay, that was MindView. The, the bit it didn't mention it, there's also, I'll just mention this briefly, there's a dictation option in, um, in my view as well. So um, especially for people in the neurodiverse spectrum, what, what what you can do, sometimes they have ideas, but um, by the time they're trying to write it down, the idea can have gone or they, 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 they don't write down correctly what they're thinking. So by dictating, you can get everything that's in your mind straight away down in, in, into a text format. And then obviously using the mind view thing afterwards, you can then um, expand or, 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 or make the text more readable. So that's just a, just a thought there. Um, final slide.
Um, we don't know what the advantages and how good it can be, so <laughs> I'm going to mention some potential disadvantages just to balance it all out again. Um, so, although I mentioned uh, about expanding the thought press in the advantages in the advantages slide, this is a this is the flip slide. So it can stifle creativity. Uh, many di neurodiverse students think outside the box and produce um, innovative innovative and imaginative ideas. And um, by using AI to steer them down the most popular and common themes. Uh, many original thoughts can be lost, so they, they're using the thought of the general consensus rather than their own particular thought, which, which like I say, that create, st stifles the creativity for, for a lot of people. Um, misleading transcripts. So auto-generated transcripts for the hearing impaired can often contain spelling mistakes and, more importantly, the wrong context, which will mislead the student. Um, incorrect auto-generated old text. So a picture is worth a thousand words. All well and good, but if the generated the old text does not convey the meaning of the image you're trying to say, then this will just cause confusion. So it's always important to remember to check and amend any generated AI transcripts, subtitles, or old text to ensure they are correct, uh, as putting them in um, incorrectly is just as bad as not doing it at all. Um, and that's me. So I'll pass on to Kat, and I'm in time. Good, get me. So I'll pass on to Kat now. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, I hope you can all see my screen okay. I see you nodding, thanks, great. Okay, so uh, what I'm gonna be discussing is how generative AI is embedded into our everyday life um, from our mobile phones to even in our homes and how it helps or impacts people with um, disability or with neurodivergences as well. So obviously this is, a lot of this is outside of the education environment. It can still, they can, people can still be affected by generative AI in a lot of ways. So firstly, with things like virtual assistants, such as Siri, Alexa, and Google Assistant, these are available on most modern smartphones or smart devices and can help make daily life much more accessible for a lot of people. So people with visual impairments, for instance, can use voice control to stay in touch with other people and perform basic tasks, such as sending text messages or scheduling appointments or even ordering food. And people who have trouble typing can also save time by using voice commands to perform tasks too. And virtual assistants can also be used to control smart home devices without needing any manual dexterity. For example, they can turn lights on and off. They can shop for items without leaving the home, which is beneficial to a lot of people with mobility impairments, for instance, or people with high anxiety. And virtual assistants can also provide reminders to help with challenges such as time blindness, which is experienced often by people with ADHD. And they can also help people with neurocognitive differences um, by asking questions without judgment and can provide accurate answers immediately, or hopefully accurate answers. Um, and then for those of you who use Google search engine, uh, you may have seen that now Gemini, which is Google's AI tool, is embedded into it. So if you Google a question now, Gemini will summarize information from various websites and display this at the top of the page. And this is useful for a lot of people, um, especially those with neurocognitive differences or for those who don't have the time to look through all the websites to find what it is that they're looking for. Oh, I should have shared that before. Um, and next up, uh, it's also embedded into things like language translation tools. So generative AI's integration into language translation on mobile phones, um, it significantly enhances the accessibility of communication across different languages. So it empowers users to understand and express themselves regardless of language barriers. And it makes information and services more accessible to everyone, including those with disabilities. So apps such as Google Translate, Microsoft Translator, and DeepL can be used to translate text between languages instantly. People can type or paste text into the app and receive immediate translations. Um, often with suggestions for contextually appropriate phases as well, so it doesn't sound as robotic. And generative AI also enables real-time voice translation, where users speak into their phone and the app translates their words into the target language, either as text or as spoken words. And this is really useful in conversations where participants maybe speak different languages, so it makes it a bit more seamless in, in the conversation. And simplified translations and contextual understanding provide generative AI help. Um, it helps individuals with cognitive disabilities. Um, it helps them comprehend and communicate in different languages more effectively if it's simplified down rather than using really complex terminology. And for non-native 
speakers, generative AI power translations can help in understanding complex texts such as legal documents, medical information or government forms, and it makes the really important information much more accessible. And uh, then also, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of AI within social media. Um, there are a lot of uses for it, some good, some bad, but I'll just cover those briefly uh, and the benefits of it. So social media obviously has grown a lot over the past years um, to adapt to the use of generative AI. And apps such as Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, and even LinkedIn all have new AI features, which makes it easier to create content, content and to use the apps themselves. So AI is used to help create posts, captions, and comments. For instance, on social media platforms, you can suggest texts for posts or replies based on the user's individual writing style and their past interactions. And these features allow users to stay connected with their friends and remain engaged with the content they're interested in with a reduced cognitive load. So they're not always coming up with new creative ideas to get involved. They can use AI to present themselves online quite easily. And AI-driven filters are common on platforms like Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok. And it allows users to create effects, enhance their photos, or even create deep fake-like content with ease, which is maybe a bit more troublesome on that side. Um, but AI also allows users who are maybe less technical or not as confident in their creative skills to create content with ease. And it makes it more inclusive for everyone. It kind of levels the playing field and everyone can get involved with creating this engaging content. Um, AI can also generate captions for videos, uh, making content more accessible to users with hearing impairments. And for visually impaired users, AI can also automatically generate descriptive text for images, such as alt text, um, posted on social media. This enables screen people with use screen readers to have their content visually described. Um, however, there are limitations to these, as Steve did touch on, and I will go into this a bit more in my, what are the limitations of it? There's a lot. Oh, I'm sorry, I've just seen there's a chat. Oh, sorry, that's the last one, Never mind. So what are the limitations of generative AI? Firstly, I'll go over generating alt text and transcripts. So any alt text for images, uh, transcripts, or closed captions that are generated by AI should be manually checked to ensure the content is accurate and corrected if need be. So in Microsoft products, automatically generated alt text is often quite vague and uninformative. For example, the screenshots on um, screen say a screenshot of a computer and a white rectangle sign with black text. Um, so this doesn't take the surrounding text and images into consideration at all, and instead solely focuses on the individual image. So like Steve say, there's a lot of context is missed with this when generating alt text. And when it comes to transcripts and closed captions, Technical terms often come from specific fields like medicine, engineering, or science, which have specialized vocabulary that isn't commonly used in everyday language. So generative AI systems might not be trained extensively on these terms, leading to misinterpretations to incorrect transcriptions. And technical fields often use acronyms or abbreviations, which can be difficult for generative AI to decipher without context. For example, RAM could be interpreted as random access memory, or it could be a type of animal, depending on the content. <laughs> Depends if you're talking to a computing department or maybe the veterinary department. And for example, um, technical terms might also have different meanings in different contexts too. So the term Python could refer to a programming language, could also refer to a snake. And generative AI is not always entirely clued up on this and differentiating the difference between them. Um, the GAI systems are often trained on data sets that include a variety. Oops, sorry, go to the next page. Sorry, excuse me, I'm just messed up with my slides here. There we go. Uh, so another limitation of generative AI is the bias that is in generative AI. So it is a complex issue that is influenced by many factors, including the data used to train it, uh, the way the algorithm works, and how people interact with these systems, uh, cultural differences as well, and the context in which the technology is applied. So generative AI models learn from large data sets, and if this data doesn't reflect the real world's diversity, the model might behave in quite biased ways. For example, if a model mainly learns from English texts, from Western sources, it might be hard to understand content from other cultures or languages. And when some groups are not well represented in the training data, the model might perform worse for them. 
This can lead to problems like speech recognition being less accurate for certain accents or the model generating content that favors more commonly represented groups. There's also concern called accessibility bias within generative AI, which happens when these systems overlook the varied needs of individual users, especially those with disabilities. For example, if a generative AI model hasn't been trained with input from people with speech difficulties, with vision or hearing impairments, or with cognitive differences, it might struggle to create content that's user-friendly for them. And this can result in outputs that are hard to read for individuals with dyslexia or voice responses that are confusing for those of people with hard of hearing or who are deaf. And this accessibility bias can further widen the digital divide, especially in higher education. And students and staff who can't use generative AI tools effectively due to these barriers may end up at a disadvantage compared to others. And this can worsen existing inequalities and limit their chances to succeed in school or at work. And addressing these, this requires a very deliberate effort to ensure that generative AI systems are inclusive and accessible to all users, regardless of their abilities. And I think it's going to be an ongoing battle for this, but it's definitely something that's not resolved yet. So it is still an ongoing issue here. And I will talk about, I know Steve mentioned this earlier on, but I'll go into a bit more information as well about gender AI systems, especially in education, can unintentionally take away individuality and creativity by steering students towards the most popular or widely accepted ideas or resources. And this can be particularly challenging for neurodivergent students who usually thrive when they can explore different viewpoints and unique approaches. So these AI systems often highlight information and resources that are commonly used or highly rated. And this can create a learning environment that feels quite repetitive, where students are always guided to the same mainstream concepts and methods. And while this might suit some, some learners, and maybe quite a lot of them, can also limit the exposure to more unique or niche resources, which could inspire creativity or provide different perspectives. So neurodivergent students, like those with ADHD, uh, autism, or dyslexia, often do better with how they can engage with learning materials suited to them and their unique ways of thinking. And this might, they might find unconventional resources more engaging and aligned with their interests. For instance, an autistic student who thinks in visual patterns might gain insights from abstract art or unique problem solving methods. But generative AI system that emphasizes popular academic resources might not suggest these types of options. And then finally, uh, I'll talk about, about the digital divide. So the digital divide among both students and staff will significantly influence their engagement with generative AI. Many AI tools offer very different features in their free versions compared to their paid versions, with the paid versions usually providing better results and being easier to use. This means that those who can't afford to pay for these tools may miss out. Obviously, at the university, we do provide some access to generative AI tools, but we're not providing premium versions to everyone because it's very expensive. So students do have to go on their own and purchase these themselves if they want to use these. Uh, additionally, variations in skill level and digital confidence will further contribute to this digital divide. So many people will lack knowledge or experience with prompt writing, which can generate more precise and creative responses from generative AI tools. In an educational environment, this can result in some students producing work which could be marked at a higher grade, perhaps. And it's, as it's been finely tuned to meet the learning outcomes while still appearing to be written by a human, um, while those who lack the knowledge of prompt writing are more likely to produce a lower quality of work or be flagged quickly for academic integrity. So that's my whistle stop tour of limitations of generative AI. Um, I will pass on to Ben, who will be covering generative AI embedded in Canvas and accessibility support. Thanks, Cass. I will try and share my screen now. Let's see if this works. Cool. You should see my background. Let's just open this up. Add yourselves there. Right. So um, I'm going to have a look at what's embedded in Canvas or virtual learning environments and um, just around more around the accessibility support that's available, not just in Canvas, but in general with the university. I'll touch a little bit on assessment but you've got an assessment session later on I think this afternoon and later in the week so um, in terms of canvas they are making inroads into embedding AI it's not available yet but these are the sorts of key things that they're sort of summarizing now the link will take you to a, a blog post from July 
they had their big um, sort of network event called InstructureCon in America, and they highlighted it. So we haven't got available um, availability, sorry, of these features yet, but I'll just tell you what they involve. And I've got a few sort of sales slides that they've provided, which should um, showcase what they can do. So um, there's going to be a search box that will appear in Canvas. So we already have one. It's called Atomic Search. We pay for that as like an extra feature on top of our Canvas instance. And it works quite well. It obviously searches through course content, brings up um, anything with keywords. The idea of this is it will obviously search through everything as well. So it will go through pages that says their assignments, discussions, announcements. The way that the AI will work is it will take the words and try and find similarities with them. So the, the way they sort of sell it is, say you search for the word guitar, it will look for anything that maybe has is a stringed instrument. So if violins mentioned ukulele, something like that, it'll start bringing things like that together. So obviously with key concepts in your own subject areas, it might bring up familiar terms and words that students can obviously go through. And obviously with AI as well, it will always update and get um, sort of stronger and better as well. They've also included um, multiple languages in there. So obviously with um, students from different backgrounds and different countries, it'll start bringing up other uh, or similar words, even if the language is in English, if they put in, say, French, it should come up with the English equivalent as well. Now, this one, um, this one's quite nice as well and great for accessibility. If you're using discussion boards in Canvas, what this will do is it will summarize everything that's been discussed into a sort of like neat little one paragraph or two paragraph um, into like a sort of summary. Now, what's quite nice with this is um, Obviously, if it's getting quite big and you're on a large cohort, you can maybe focus that summary into like a sort of smaller subject area or a topic. I sort of see it as if any of you have used Amazon recently, whether you agree with them or not, if you have a look at their review sections, they have that sort of general review where it's sort of AI powered where it'll summarize all the reviews of a, of, of a sort of product. This is more or less the same, but in this instance, you have control as a user to define what you want that summary to include. So the sort of pros and cons, obviously, of students not going in and engaging with the content, but there's the other flip side of being able to summarize it and bring it all to the fore and then investigate further. So it'll take a bit of digital literacy skill to sort of get students to use this properly to engage with sort of discussions. And then sort of touched on it on the first smart search, but they're talking about putting better translation models within Canvas. So what will happen is students can obviously change the language, which they can do now with the immersive reader. I'll go into Canvas and show you where that is, um, but it'll translate everything. I don't think anyone's really using the inbox messaging feature, but it'll do everything else like discussions, the group areas, the pages, everything like that. Um, it's, you can see there it's got a, a multilingual model from Amazon Web Server. So um, it says it'll be enabled on course level. So obviously tutors can turn that on and off on their own courses. But with the fact that it's got that AI powered in there, it'll obviously update and, and sort of include any translations when language updates as well. I know um, when me and Rob with Laura and CI did a session for year 11 students a couple of months ago, we were getting the word slay written to us on the feedback form, which we thought was a negative thing, but apparently it's a positive thing with people who are under the age of 16. So. Yeah, we'll take that one. Maybe it'll translate any of the sorts of developments in language too. Um, so this is just going more into the more accessibility standards within Canvas. And um, this link at the very top will take you to their guidance. And it sort of links to what Steve was talking about with some of the tools. So again, these slides will be on Padlet, but just to highlight on here what's here, it talks about things like JAWS, which uh, Steve showed, but also things that, um, you know, keyboard shortcuts, um, how to improve navigation, um, things about like the, uh, if you're using Canvas Studio, how it can sort of auto-generate subtitles and what users can do as well. Um, before I go any further into Ally and the more the accessibility, I'll go back into um, the co-pilot area. I'll open up Edge and we've got Canvas here. So they've not really pushed this one Canvas yet, but I know Rob and um, Gary talked about it yesterday in the intro to GAI in that obviously with our students and also staff with Microsoft Edge, we've got a bit the ability to enable the co-pilot AI on Edge. 
And what it can do is you can use it to interact with Canvas to a certain degree. Um, if I take, for example, this Canvas Health uh, staff course, which you all have access to, if I open up the modules area, it's a complete mess in here. We've got folders, we've got all kinds of um, different links. We sort of get people to use the home page instead, which some of you might do with your courses. But with the Copilot interface, we could do things like it's suggesting they generate a page summary. So I can say something like, um, can you summarize um, what the main topics are on this page? Let's see. Let's see what comes back. And then what we should see is hopefully it'll start picking up keywords and sort of summarizing it. So a bit like that sort of smart search for the discussion boards, but um, hopefully it'll sort of scan it. So it's scanning the page here, it's it's bringing it up. So it's picked up the getting started assessments. I'm guessing it's taking the module um, headers there, very brief. And then obviously I can start interrogating it more about, you know, um, about speed grade and things. Um, it's quite nice as well from a student point of view as a learning one. I've done um, something like, can, if I open up something like this files one, just generating like revision questions. So I'll put someone, can you generate five MCQs from this page for me to revise from? And then again, it's sort of scanning the text there and, and generating some text. So you can see here, it's generating some nice MCQs. So you could do this obviously as, members of staff, if you've got your own documents, start to interrogate your own stuff and generating it there. Um, I'm interested that it's not actually highlighting what the correct answer is there. So that's quite interesting. But anyway, um, as it's sort of generating that, it's looking at contents. The thing I found quite limited with it was the um, ability to sort of highlight. So if I said something like, um, can you show me where, I don't know, canvas is mentioned on the page. It sort of gets stuck here. It did yesterday when I was playing with it, and it's, but it does give you instructions now. You could do that using the, okay, it is looking at it, but um, yeah, it's sort of showing it there. I wonder if it's even got all more updates. Basically what happened yesterday is when I was trying to do it, um, it was going, oh, I can't read the um, page. We're going to have to um, use Control F on the on the key keyboard, and you'll be able to use the um, Find feature on Chrome. So it does obviously give you more um, options on there. But obviously, it's, it's a little bit more um, smarter than I thought it was. But anyway, I won't dive into this. We'll hopefully have more um, stuff from Canvas around um, sort of data literacy and, and prompt writing. But CIE, they've got all kinds of um, resources around prompt writing, which can help you not only with this, but just developing stuff with your own teaching and learning. Um, right, so I'll go back to the slide just to remind myself what I was going to talk about. Yeah, so this stuff. So um, Blackboard Ally, which you may be aware of, that sort of scans every bit of documents or every bit of content within your course and generates an overall score between zero and 100%. Now, our goal in the university is to get everything up to 70%, but at the moment, we're sort of lingering on that 57.9, as you can see there, for this upcoming year. I'll go into the settings just so you can see what it looks like. And if any of you are um, professional service members of staff in your departments, you'll be able to get to this same report as well in Canvas if you have depth admin rights. Um, the immersive reader is automatically applied. I'll show you that as well. And there's a really nice feature in your accounts, which you can enable certain things on and off as well. So let's have a look at Ally first. So that's under this admin button. Like I said, you need to have depth admin access to this. And then if I go to Ally report, and we should see the university's score. So I got that score from here. So these at the bottom are the different academic years. We've had Canvas now for five years. So if I go back, we were scoring about 46.1, as you can see there in the overall score, but we're now up to 56.5. So we have seen a jump there, but we still do need to get up by 15% there to get into that sort of agreeable um, percentage 
if you want to see what the most common issues are, it's these here. So we've got at the moment 103,000 um, instances where images don't have alt text on them. So that's something that needs to be improved. Um, documents that have got contrast issues, that's our second biggest issue, where um, it's obviously with colors or um, highlighted stuff's not showing up. Then we've got 51,000 issues where documents don't have um, a description on images, so more or less a, a copy of the first one. Documents missing a title, so people aren't putting the appropriate headings in their documents, and similar here for uh, number five. I'm not going to go into um, Office um, features, but obviously in there, there's an accessibility checker where you can go in and improve those features if need be. And Ally itself, just to show you what that looks like if you haven't seen it before, I'll just open up a course. Um, you'll see it, it's like a little speed dial, but there's no AI as part of it. It's, it's automatic in terms of what it does, but it depends on the user themselves to improve things. So for example, this here, this lecture notes, that needs to be improved. It's on that sort of medium. If I click on it, this is Ally now kicking in. Um, this, what have I got here? Is it a document? So I've got a little bar there. Yeah, so I've got a document that has no end uh, description. So I'm obviously part of that main problem that's going on, but it's my test course, so no one can see it. But anyway, what we've got here is instructions on how to fix it. So there's no AI as part of this, but this is just good practice just to get into um, in terms of just improving the accessibility. Now, um, let me come out of this because I'll show you the immersive reader. So it's automatically applied. Um, IT is turned on. So you shouldn't have to worry about it from your course about whether it's on or off. I um, don't know why it's taken a while. Let's try that again. Now, it normally appears when the student opens up um, either the, more or less the page. I'll open up the page first and it's there in the top right. So by clicking on this, it's powered by um, Office. So what you can do in here is you can um, obviously read out what's on the page. You can change the size of the text. It's really great for those with visual impairments. Um, you can put a background color as well to make it easier to see. And um, you can show the formatting, which is quite cool if it's bold or underlined, see the other stuff. Um, you can obviously highlight the grammar. There is um, syllables as well, so it breaks it up. And then we've got ones where it sort of highlights part of the page, which is quite cool as well. There's a picture dictionary. I always quite laugh at this one, see what it generates. It changes words into pictures, but I don't think I've got anything here. So again, if I add something like, I don't know, um, a dog, it should show like a little picture of a dog as well. Um, and then there's a translation option as well. This isn't the AI powered one that will be enabled within the course. But for now, we do have the ability where we can change um, the language here. So that's quite a nice feature. And then the last one is just the user settings. So under here, if you click on your name and then go to settings and then scroll down. So sorry, I'm going to scroll right to the bottom. Let's ignore all this. There's all these features which will enhance accessibility within Canvas. So getting the closed captions to show automatically, that's on, at the moment and disabled for me. So you can turn it on there. Um, we've got things like, um, well, keyboard shortcuts we want to keep. High contrast UI, so that's quite nice. That sort of enhances the color contrast. Um, we've got um, the immersive reader. Like I said, that'll be automatically applied to your course. Uh, underline links, that's really useful for um, disabled students. So the ability that links will be highlighted, very easy to see. They can turn that on as well. Right, let's go back into here. Skip that slide because we've already looked at it. Okay, so um, in terms of the um, academic integrity and uh, sort of the use of AI in assessments, You'll have another talk that will go into more detail about this, but just for your own knowledge, if you don't know already, we did have the AI detector. That was a Turnitin tool, but it was applied to all our assessment tools. That has now been removed, so you can't use that anymore as a guide um, to detect um, the, the use of generative AI. The similarity report is still there, 
So that'll still exist both in SpeedGrader and Turnitin if you're using either tool. But um, that, like I said, there's all kinds of guidance, which I'll share with you at the end of the link to under the CIE website. There's a Genesive AI web page of um, ways that you can sort of adapt your assessments and improve your assessment standards and ways that you can incorporate it into your assessments as well. Um, but I've got some tips here just from my own experience. Not everyone will probably agree with these, but um, just to go through them from the left end. So improvements for staff, I always think it's worth allowing students to see that similarity report before the deadline. Some schools set up a sort of practice link in the assessments area. And what you can do as well is you can make sure the papers don't store in the database. So how it works in Turnitin is whenever a student uploads that paper, it joins this sort of massive network of papers from the web and anyone else is using Turnitin. But there's a setting where you can say, do not store the paper. And it'll still generate a percentage score, but it just means when the student then goes to do their final submission, you're not getting a load of reports that say 100% and they're, they're seeing a self-plagiarise because they've already submitted beforehand. But you can still use the, the, the final submission link as long as the students submit beforehand and you can change the setting that they can see it, then you know that's another thing that you can look into as well. Um, inclusive assessment design, we've been looking at that in CIE, um, adapting rubrics. There's a lot of um, sort of assessments, especially like presentations that penalize students with certain disabilities. So people are looking at adapting their rubrics to be more inclusive with certain disabilities and look at an alternative assessment formats. You know, we've seen some of the tools today uh, that can help with sort of generating content, but um, you know, there's always different ways that we can assess the students and allow them to submit. And have a look if you're doing any quizzes online or even assessments, allowing those reasonable adjustments. Some people extend the um, due date. There's the ability to allow students to see a different due date and, and assessment time away from the cohort. With quizzes as well, you can give extra time and um, none of the other students are, I think, the wiser. And then just tips for students quickly, um, just be wary of students using third party tools to check for that AI detection now that we don't have it. Um, we've seen in the past student work being sold on in that they've uploaded stuff to a free website and then it turns out like their data is being shared, their papers being sold on to an essay mill, they're being blackmailed by these companies down the line to say, you got your essay from us, we need X amount of money. I'm not saying that's all a Liverpool issue, we've seen it worldwide. So just be wary of that and that sort of feeds into why I'd allow students to see that report. But again, that's my personal opinion. Um, ask about the assistive tech. You know, you've got Steve here today. He's got his email address, which I'll share with you. And there's the disability advice and guidance team. They've got a series of coaches who are students who have got certain disabilities who can help and advise. Again, I'll give you some of the uh, contact details around that. Um, also find out about support plans. Make sure students are signed up for it, no matter how small or big their issue might be with certain disabilities, whether it's dyslexia or blindness get them to speak to someone and get that support plan in place because then they'll get the further support of technology funding equipment that's available from them for just being a student on a support plan. Um, I've put calendar reminders. This is just a, an issue I've seen with students, especially those students with disabilities that they've said, because Canvas is so intricate and, and not well at sort of combining modules within a program that I found students who have set calendar reminders just to be able to see when assessments are due and when certain things are happening, just to use the calendar, whether it's in Canvas or their own Outlook, really. Um, but like I said, that's, I'm not really touching on AI here. Um, there's going to be a series of workshops. We've got the Canvas Bootcamp next week in CIE, and um, we've got a, our own festival um, and accessibility week, which I will plug in a second. Um, here's all the details. I'll put these in the Padlet. I know it's a lot to take in. But if you want to take a note of the email addresses you've got, if you need any help with Canvas or Turnitin or any of the tools there, um, email at Digital Ed, which is sort of the digital education group within CIE. And then there's all kinds of links there to um, self-paced resources. You've also maybe got learning technologists within your department or professional service staff who have taken that role on. So do speak with them too. Um, if you want to speak to CIE in general, we've got our own general email. There's a couple of us on the call too. 
um, some of them who have more expertise within assessments than I am. Um, we've got our inclusive curriculum toolkit, which will help with things like the inclusive assessment design. And there's a series of resources and guides that will cover everything from the tools I've mentioned to just general practice of learning and teaching, active learning examples of what authentic assessments, which all have inclusivity embedded within them. Now it's part of the, the education strategy. And then obviously, if you need help with any sort of student support, with accessibility or Canvas. We've got our own course in there. There's the 24 seven tier one support, which is like the live chat. Send students to that if you can, and um, saves you getting emailed all the time. There's the um, disability team as well. They do have the coaches, which will probably start during, probably after welcome week, um, 11 till two every day on the ground floor of the LSOP building. It's the old um, Blackwells where it used to be. And then you've got Steve's address there as well, if you want to talk to him about any of the content. And then just me and Kat and Steve shamelessly plugging our session. Uh, we're doing something similar to this, which will be an accessibility festival. We are finalizing the dates and who's going to be doing what, but this is just a taste of what we've got included. So uh, a little bit of more in depth of what we've talked about today, you know, stuff Kat talked about with social media, um, all the stuff I've talked about with inclusivity with digital tools. Um, and all stuff Steve's talked about there is, is available. But we'll get the library to come and do something. We'll get that disability advice and guidance team to present their um, sort of help and support. We've got some of the software vendors coming that week as well. And we've got some local charities, Everton in the community and Strawberry Fields have agreed to come, I think, on the Tuesday. Just need to book a room for that. Uh, and we're still finalising some other stuff as well, um, mainly around um, stuff that can help with you in your day-to-day -day teaching and your own work life. But if you're interested in it, just email us, but I'll take a note of who's come today and we'll circulate our sign-up form as soon as it's ready. I'm hoping by the end of this week, but that's it for me.